so I am really, really grateful. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, it's just starting. Yep, that's it. Yeah, actually, as Jillian mentioned, it was a very short time. And so I just wanted to plug in a few things which I can talk today. Uh, so hello, everyone. I am Dr. Priyanka Chaurasi. I'm a lecturer at Ulster University. So a brief background, I'm in, um, I've I mean, I've done my PhD from Ulster and I've worked in different research associate positions um, in, in Ulster as well as in Sheik. So my basic area is on healthcare background. So uh, today I'd like to talk on the big data applying AI to the healthcare and one of the particular cases which we have seen in analyzing. So why big data? Because big data is on rise and um, Earlier, when whatever we were not able to access initially from the data resources, we have um, plethora of available resources from where we can get data. So if you see here, there is loads of volume, velocity, variety, veracity, and value to it. So there are datas which, which are existing in loads of um, different servers which you can have an access to which were not previously accessed. Then there are census data like data streaming in process like live videos, audios, and other things. And there are different forms of data like uh, earlier the data used to be in a very, very traditional databases like um, like a DB2 and those kind of Oracle databases. But now you can get data from even the text file, the audio files, the images. And then there is always when the data is available in so much quantity, the quality of the data is always a question. So that's the thing when veracity comes into picture. And uh, when we do this kind of data analysis and work, you will generally end up in lots of waste data. So loads of data cleaning is always in process. So even though the big data um, handles, handovers you loads of data, but it, you have to spend multiple times doing the cleaning of it and then getting the value of that uh, out from that data is what your business model requires. So there are different kinds of data which we can come across like the tra traditional structured data which comes into like Excel files and CVs. Generally the businesses they store their data into Excel sheets and CSV format files or the traditional databases. But now we have loads of information like graph theory is common in picture. Most of the hospital data like HL7 messages, they are all connected through a graph based data. Other kinds of data as like unstructured data, like your text documents, images, and audios. So uh, the big data variety has obviously increased a lot. You can get it from multiple resources and there are different multiple applications which you can get it. So big data and the data science, what does it mean is like big data is more connected with the storage part of it, how you're going to store your data, where is your data existing, in what format it is existing, and where is the data science is the one where you do all the dicing, processing, and analyzing of the work. So the big data is the storage and the data science is the applications, and that is where the AI and the machine learning come into picture. So when once once you get the data, what you do with it? So the process is generally you do the data mining or extracting meaningful insights from the raw data. So it is similar to the data mining process where you do the knowledge discovery in databases. Um, so the process is like you get the data, then you have to do a lot of background pre-processing and then transform data into a format where you algorithms and the machine learning can understand that data. So this background work is the generally the most of the time where loads of time is consumed. And then from that you model a data and try to analyze the patterns in the data and discover a knowledge out of it. So the business process and the crisp DM, generally this is the cross industry standard process for data mining, where you first understand what is the business requirement and then do the data understanding followed by the preparation of data then doing modeling and evaluation and the deployment. So uh, the meaningful insight, so predicting data with a certain degree of certainty, like can you generalize a, a hypothesis or like uh, what you have observed from the data, can it be generalized? Uh, insights found in the data are discoveries and discoveries are expressed as models and models are the one which is going to make the prediction. So basically what you will see is uh, you get the base from the data here and then 
you build a model and this is where your machine learning learning and the ai comes into picture and then there is a prediction so uh, one of the main application you will see it is in the healthcare systems and uh, this can be in any of the domain like uh, even analyzing the patient outcome optimizations of resources how the financial analysis can be done can patient satisfaction be improved uh, through the analysis of the data so the process is quite um, it it is like a recursive process you start with one process and then you end up redoing that process again once your outcome is not matching so you get the raw data clean the data and build the model and predict it so machine learning and artificial intelligence how does that comes into picture so ml is more motor that drives the data science so ml algorithms to do the part of the data science that is trickiest to explain and most fun to work with so what you do is like science of getting computers to learn without being explicitly programmed so you don't program your um, um codes to do certain things but you learn from the data to do certain things like robots driverless cars they are all learning from the user's pattern and try to feed into the algorithm to get the result of it so what you do is re you recognize and understand the input data make decisions based on the supply data and making machines to think like human like um if if a robot is going to learn from you the patterns how you do certain behavior in an environment the robot will try to replicate it so learning from the data to predict future observations that is one of the most common applications you will come across system automatically learns and improves with experience so that is what is called the feed in data so what uh, machine learning generally does it it tries to find a pattern in the data like each ml method al algorithm will take I will take in the data, turn it over, and split out an answer. So that is what it does, in very basic terms. So the process is of extracting knowledge or insights from the data in various forms, either structured or unstructured. So what we do is we analyze large data sets to find novel, commercially valuable, and exploitable patterns, and that is what it is called the meaningful insights. so there are different areas where this application holds so one of the common is the healthcare then we have the credit insurance sales social media and the travel so wherever you can get the data you can apply it in some sense it will all depend on the requirement of the business process so the deliverables are there are different kinds of um Data, uh, machine learning techniques which are employed the common one you will come across is like the prediction classifications and recommendation systems like uh, when you log in to your amazon or netflix or youtube it tries to recommend certain history uh, certain videos or um serials based on your history of search pattern so it is trying to learn your behavior and try to detect another one is a anomaly detection like certain times you will get the spam email so it tries to detect the abnormalities in your mails and even in the fraud detection it is quite common like when you have like the credit history and the customer has not done any certain kind of transaction in that zone you get a notification that it might be a malicious event happening so those kind of things are one of the very common applications you will come across so uh, most of the common applications in the ai of ml application is in vision processing language processing forecasting pattern recognition games expert system and robotics so the first seven falls in the ai field and the data mining analytics application of machine learning is one another area so the common examples is web search on google so it will uh, the, in the background there are ml software which are running and they try to predict um you history patterns then facebook photo id identification these are all ai applications a spam filtering how to distinguish between the non spam and the spam filters then amazon is doing the there is a background recommender engine running which learns your pattern and also learns like if a particular product has been searched what are the connected project which it can show you in the um, history those things are quite common examples so like self driving google car is quite commonly talked so there are so many applications you can see uh, one specific application like if the rob if you have deployed a robot to 
tidy your house how does it will do so the what it will do it it will run learn from your observation so basically it is analyzing the data in background and learn what objects you pick and where you put them and then when you are not there you try to do the same thing even when you are not there so this is are the one of the common examples so relation with ai so you'll hear a lot of about ai and the machine learning so availability of practically infinite storage and a flood of data for every stripe has created this ai boom so uh, earlier what we, what was happening in on a single processor with a small cap capacity of the machines now we have graphical processing unit where the events can run in the parallel so you can have multiple things running at the same time so the processing has time has reduced and the quality has increased so that's why this boom of ai has come into picture so that all run, runs basically on the gpu accelerated computing so things are running faster in a simple term so um, whatever initially was running in a single processor you can run it on a multiple process and you can do the processing quite fast so ml approaches in a basic algorithm what you do is you pass the data learn from it and then make determine determination or prediction about something so what you are not doing is you're not hard coding your software you are actually making the data and train the model and then then learn the tasks so that is what is happening so you're uh, so i mean when we say not coding means we are actually coding just to put the algorithms into place and learn from the data so there is no hard and fast rule as as in when your data will change your predictions might change so that is what the um that is what the dependency on the data is so what you do in traditional programming is you have a data you program and you get the output but in machine learning it is you have the data you have the output and you build the program you get the program out of your data and the corresponding outputs so uh, still there are limitations a uh, very best application is computer vision but you will still do a lot of hand coding work to do the job done because um i mean the algorithm learns and understands certain patterns certain the way the way the data should be fed into the algorithm so those kind of things are still limitations there so deep learning so deep learning is another thing which is quite common in picture now so it, it enabled many practical applications of ml by extending the overall field of ai so it breaks down task in ways that makes all kinds of machine as uh, seem seem, uh, seem possible so the concept was like the ai first come came into picture so that is the largest and then uh, machine learning came into picture which was trying to class do the classification and then was the deep learning where deep learning was like it is trying to learn the data from the data in quite core things so um, i'll just discuss a very brief on what we did with the data analytics part and applying machine learning so this was like analyzing the patient data and how they do adopt or not adopt the technology based on their different backgrounds so the study was like using an assistive technology so people with dementia may may be reluctant to change their routine and use of technology may cause apprehensions due to the inability to um to use use the device and making it mistake so instead of just recommending a technology to everyone what we are trying to balance is learn the user background and then only recommend the technology so in this one what we did was we profile adoption and non adopt uh, and non adoption so that is who are the people who will adopt to a technology and who are the people who will refuse the technology based on certain backgrounds like um, we we chose a set of convenient non invasive and low cost set of features to model the prediction of whether the person will use the technology or not use the technology because in the care setting what happens is like if a technology is wrongly recommended to a person it can aggravate their conditions because they are not able to use it and they find it hard so what we did it we did a combination of features and did loads of analysis to find out who are the adopters and non adopters based on a reminder system so in the picture you can see the there is a tot reminder app that is available on the google play store uh, what it was doing is it 
it has a set of reminders set up for the patient to use it in different settings. So what we were doing is we were trying to identify which features directly or indirectly correlate to the adoptions and which features do not. So there was a number of combination of taught data sources. So there was first one was the app usage. So the, this is the app, the taught app, which, uh, which was being used like in what setting the patient is using it, the number of set, number of acknowledgement done, number of missed, time to acknowledge it and time to use. So how they are basically using the app. Apart from that, this, these patients were recruited from the CCSMA data set. So this is the from University of Utah. We have a data set where, where, where the patient data has a different information of functional and medical, their psychiatric histories, their dietary and social and lifestyle behavior. Other than that, we also have the medical history data on uh, what kind of diseases in, pre, in the, they have and what that might affect the adoption of technologies. So there were initial characterization done, then the, there was a six month assessment and the 12th month assessment of using this particular app. So what we did was like CCMA is the catch county study on memory and aging. So this project involves a collaborative group of researchers from different universities. And it is quite, uh, long, quite a big longitudinal study where the patients older than 60 years are recruited. And um, in the study, so what we did was like we did the subject recruitment process. We um, we and we try, uh, send the we found how many people are eligible, and the request was sent uh, sent to them to take part in the study. And there were few who reject, refused. And finally, there was a very very small number compared to three forty seven. It came to like very few people who actually took part in the study. So there were. Uh, 152 adopt, uh, refusers and 21 adopters and still you will see that during the duration of the study because of their medical condition and sickness people were dropping out and people passed away as well and sometimes people were not using the device at all they just kept it in their drawers and uh, returned it back after a year without using it at all so those are the different scenarios so you can see that uh, the technology adoption I mean, just recommending a technology to everyone may not work out. We need to understand their history and what are the uses scenarios. So um, initially, when we were characterizing the people into different groups, uh, we characterized as can they use the technology or they are willing to use the technology. So people who were able to use the technology and they are willing to use the technology, they were categorized as adopters and rest all the three categories were categorized as the non-adopters. So what we did is like when you see that uh, the initial recruitment status was like this, most of the people refused, uh, some people passed away, unfortunately, and some people were unable to reach. reach. So there is always a dropout in the um, data that will always happen when you have a longitudinal study. So here's a brief, uh, how many, I mean, the good part of this data was like, almost there was a 50% male and 50% female. That's a very rare uh, inclusion thing you will see in a data of this kind or any kind. Um, so this is just a brief information on their background history, where their employment status, where they were employed. And one finding was like people who were in mostly on the higher education, clerical staff and all, they were willing to adopt to the technology compared to a person who is a farmer. So these kind of insights we are getting from the data. And uh, this is like, what are the features that which will impact the technology adoption? So we came up with loads of features that can actually impact your understanding and knowledge of adopting a technology. So there are loads of health condition which can impact your, um, your willingness to adopt a technology, your age, ethnicity, gender, education was one thing, which was obviously one of the common factor. Then if you, People who had dementia, they were the one who will be the potential refusers because because of their health condition, they cannot be recommended a technology. So those those people need a proper care setting instead of just handing over a technology to them. So this was the initial study which we did, and this this is all the data dictionary we had for um, what are the features included in the study, 
and the details are here like what all the features we included and uh, how did we prune it so we had loads of features and then we came down to this 31 features which we understood that this is going to be uh, understandable and from the, the here we started to build up the model and how the people have participated in the study so if you see here is like we build the model with different algorithms so initial feature selection was done and the data was categorized into different categories. So if you see that there is a set of personal data, there is a set of commodity data, dementia data, genetic and the observation data. So when we did this analysis and applied the algorithms with a uh, certain degree of certainty, we can say what are the people who are going to adopt or not adopt to the technology. So but when we were feeding in the data, there were loads of categories. So instead of that, what we did was like uh, we did the discretization of the data and we reduced the number of labels to just to um, remove the variance in the data. And that is the way we fed into the model. So you will see that loads of processing goes in the background to do the analysis part. And when we started to do the correlation testing, uh, certain features were highlighted as they are quite important, whether the uh, in, in the decision of a per person is going to adopt to a technology or not adopt to the technology. So these are the common features which came across that the gender, age, education, diabetes, co cholesterol, and if they, they have take part in the ob observational studies, they are the people who will be willing to take part in the study. So apart from that, we did another kind of uh, multivariate analysis to find out who are the people who will adopt or refuse. So from here, we got more uh, set of data. And another thing one which comes quite common is like there is always a data imbalance, like um, compared to people refusing to a study and compared to people adopting to the study, there will be loads of variance. There will be always a very minimum number who will try to willing to take part. And there will be people who will be refusing. So if you directly feed this to the model, there will be a lot of uh, discrepancy and that is what you need to handle it. So that's why it's always necessary that we equalize the classes. So we generate more of synthetic data and then try to balance the classes so that the minority and the majority classes have the similar um, balancing in the data sets. And that is the way the algorithm can work correctly. And based on this analysis, what we found are these are the final features which are important and are required in in this when we are saying are required we are saying in this particular data set what we found so we found like the gender age education job your dementia and stroke other health conditions are are the factors which are going to can contribute whether the person can adopt or cannot adopt a technology so that is what are the results from here and um, more specific, you can see here uh, what we considered in the another data set was like number of time the person has got hospitalized and for what kind of uh, diseases they were hospitalized in the hospital and in recent three years if they have been hospitalized. So there are loads of analysis we, which we have done in this data set. Uh, it's difficult to cover in this session, but what we found from this data is like um, there are factors which do contribute to the adoption and non-adoption of technology. And these are the results we have got from the data set. And uh, when we combined both the CCMA and the UPDB data set, the features were quite enhanced. And that is the way we got a higher accuracy and the system was quite good in predicting the features. Um, with 20 features, we were able to get the good accuracy with both the NN and the KNN models. So that is what we have done in this data thing. And uh, I mean, we have the papers, but I know it's more of for the SME. So this this work is not very relevant to them, but I just wanted to give the talk on this part. So thank you for listening. And does anybody has any questions? This is brilliant, Priyanka, thank you. I mean, that's really fascinating to see, you know, just the, ins and outs and on what um you know how you built it and um the models and the outputs but just you know all the things that you thought of for the study um and, and a really great overview of um you know 
AI and machine learning and, and, and um, data science and data analytics too. Um, has anyone any questions? You can shout out or just put it in the chat there. Um, there was one of the things um, you, were, you mentioned at, um, at the beginning about Netflix, you know, when they make recommendations. Um, Netflix mm -hmm. actually wrote House of Cards, which is one of their biggest successes early mm -hmm. on um, from um, the, all the data that they gathered on what people liked and what actors they liked and what storylines they liked. And so it's nearly going back to Josh's um, creating content um, from AI. Um, I think people actually wrote it, but the storylines, you know, they did, um, the storylines and the character were um, sort of recommended through um, artificial intelligence and big data. Um, anyone, any other questions or observations? That was really, really interesting. Thank you. Um, I, I guess the other Go ahead, sorry. No, I guess there I, is no questions or anything. Um, I, I know it's very academic work compared to the business work we, the webinar is. Yeah, no, no, no. I think it's really interesting because I think it's it gives people an insight to what goes on in the background. And also, you know, say somebody is going to say somebody's developing a product for an older person, say the sort of work that you've already done, should, you know, is there for people to sort of leverage those insights that you've got um, or, you know, other studies or whatever using those tools. So, um, no, I think it was fantastic thank you and i and and that's the point of the webinar it's trying to get a whole really broad spectrum of views and um um on the technology as well yeah um thank you very much thank um, you thank you Jillian, for your time no thank you um so i have put the, um oh mary has asked do you think that applying some of these models while seeking to identify patients can actually end up being used to exclude patient populations who do not use the health system that's an interesting one yeah that case happened like uh, if the people are not participating in the study they are obviously excluded from the initial uh, characterization another thing is like if the model is predicting or um, like suppose uh, if my model has predicted that this person will refuse the technology, but actually they were willing to uh, accept the technology. So in that way, there is always an uh, error which happens. So models are not always 100% accurate. That is one thing. So it is like we say with certain degree of certainty, we can recommend or we cannot recommend. That is the way. And then uh, what all the data insight will help you in doing is give you the initial baseline. And is obviously there are always the stakeholder engagements like the ex experts who will can further analyze. So this is just like the first base step to do with the modeling part. And then like, I mean, obviously machine, machine learning algorithms cannot replace the GPs to say whether to do or not to do. So it is always the G, but what it will do is like, uh, it will be the final decision from the GPs, but it will assist in assist the GPs in making the initial de decision. That is what we do through these technologies. Yeah. And I suppose as well, like I know Joan at Ulster University is doing a lot of work with carers. And yeah, I work with Joan. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, you know, there's the, the, your work and then the work.